Gracious Heavenly Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, praising you for the privilege and the opportunity to study your precious word together. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher. May he strip away that which is foolish and ignorant, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, that we might grow more in the wonder of your grace and your love. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, welcome to Blessed Hope Forever. We are studying together 2 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we've come to the beginning of chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. The uh, second epistle was addressed to the believers at Corinth, a carnal group of Christians. As a result of what the Holy Spirit had done in the writing of the first epistle, uh, we've seen that we are placed in a hostile environment the Lord said, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. And as I've pointed out uh, in previous studies, uh, no shepherd in his right mind would do that unless, unless we could rest in the sovereignty uh, of God, the, the sovereign deliverance of our God. The second epistle points out that God has placed us in that hostile environment as witnesses, as ambassadors, God has told us that we're in an environment where we're despised and rejected. The conflict being between law and grace. In the third chapter, we saw that the first covenant, the covenant of law, that's, that's what the Corinthians were living in, was an established legalism uh, that if you met certain criteria, you'd be in good shape. And uh, that's where most of Christianity, I believe, is today. You know, they want some rules by which they, they live uh, the Christian life. They want rules to govern their life. And folks were called to live by grace. We were never given the law. We were told that law is administration of death and of condemnation, whereas the gospel that we proclaim is one of liberty and freedom by the grace of God. What a contrast. We started in the fourth chapter, then with the amazing announcement that we have a ministry of liberty, and yet we shouldn't be discouraged. We shouldn't be discouraged because the message is not going to be widely received. It's not going to be popular. The great effort of Christianity today is to make it uh, popular and meaningful to everybody. The fourth chapter clearly says that there are those who will not hear, so don't get discouraged when they don't. Their minds have been blinded by the God of this age. However, there are those who must hear because God commanded them to hear, and that's not because they decided to hear. Imagine how blasphemous it is to suggest that paganism is the better approach to God than grace. You know, it's the pagan who said that there must be repentance before there is life. It's the grace of God who says, I will give you a new life and then you'll repent. Fantastic difference between grace and law. So we go through our lives proclaiming a fantastic message that's not very well received. It's not very... It's not popularly received, but we're just not to be discouraged. To be discouraged 
is to, would be to fall back to things that are shameful and deceitful in order to get the message across. Whether people are in heaven or hell is not left to your disposition. There are those who cannot hear and there are those who must hear because God commanded the light to shine in their hearts. God commanded the light to shine, therefore it will shine. It will shine. It is inconceivable that when God said in Genesis, let there be light, that, that the, you know, the, the darkness might have said, well, or I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want there to be light. Well, of course there was light. God said it. There had to be, and God commanded it. He commanded that the light would shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, in the face of Jesus Christ. I believe you could translate that in the person of Jesus Christ. I don't need to resort to shameful tactics or deceit or trickery or anything else to get the message across. God will do that. And believe me, that is a great burden off my shoulders. And it should be to yours as well. Beginning at the seventh verse, we saw that we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the power may be of God and not of ourselves. This treasure being the knowledge of the glory of God in the person of Christ. But we don't want that. We want the excellency of the power to be of us. We were placed in an environment that is totally hostile to these marvelous truths. Okay? And the Lord said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. So the picture that we see is a, a brittle vessel of clay placed in a hostile environment. Just as God commands the light to shine in some hearts, he, pres he preserves these vessels, these brittle vessels of fired clay. But we want to appear strong and made of titanium. Folks, you weren't placed here to run the political system. You weren't placed here to be heroes in your community. You were called to be a fired vessel of clay, despised and rejected, the off-scouring of the world religious system, in order that the excellency of the power might be of God and not you. We're not here to run things. That comes later. Our, our being joint heirs with Christ, co-reigning with Christ. That's later. We're not here to run things. We're here to proclaim the truth of the Word of God. That's why we're here. Our hope is not in purifying the society, not in turning the country around. Our hope, verses 14 and 15, is that we are raised with Christ. That's our blessed hope. That, that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up with Jesus. And he did in Romans 6. When Christ was raised from the dead, you were raised from the dead. You, you Obviously, you, you, you don't have any experience of that, but God says that's what occurred. You may not have known it yet. You may not have heard about it yet, but God will command the light to shine in your heart if he does it, it won't shine, and you weren't raised with Christ. But he speaks to his own people, and that's our hope. All of these things, the despair, the discouragement, the perplexity, the persecution, the bearing about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus are for your sakes, the elect's sake. Paul said, I suffer all things for the elect's sake. 
in order that the abundant grace might be might by means of the thanksgiving of God's elect redound to the glory of God. We're not here to bring glory to ourselves, but to God, and He'll do that. It looks as though He takes His time and He moves very slowly, but He will do it. Therefore, seeing that we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. We do not become discouraged. We are not discouraged, but through our but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Our outward man perishes. The word means become disabled put out of service, made of no effect, inoperable, made inoperable. I believe that the outward man in this particular case is the old nature in a body of clay. I believe that, it, that there's layers like onions to this. Now that word is a present indicative. It's a, it's a, it's a passive voice, is being made to perish, is being put out of service. Now that, that could be, could very well be our physical body or our old sinful nature. Take your pick. I tend to lean toward both, looking at that as those two layers, you know, like onion layers. There. Every one of us anticipates the Lord's return before we die. Every one of you deep in your heart knows that if He doesn't return, you're going to die. But I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to us here, that it's a waste of time to try and operate as a Christian in the, in the realm of sin, self, the flesh, law-keeping, as a rule of life, in the sphere of that which is outward, the flesh, that God has no dealings with whatsoever. God has nothing to do with the flesh. Trying to clean up the outward man since we've, since we've been crucified and raised with Christ to walk in newness of life, not in oldness of the letter, which is law, which is the old covenant, but we also spend a great amount of time establishing the uh, security and the well-being of that outward man, which God says is being made to perish. It, it doesn't have a renewing every day. It's not being renewed every day like the inward man. It's the inward man that's being, and that's passive voice. God's the operator here. He's doing the operating. Renewed every day. What would ever lead us to spend so much time caring for its needs and so little time feeding the inward man? where we spend more time on human logic than we do the Word of God. Human reasoning, human plans, human hopes, human dreams. Dearly beloved, we haven't been given a ministry which caters to the outward man. He's going to perish. where it's going to look from all outward appearances as if the enemy has won. No wonder our affliction is said to be light, not heavy. And as I pointed out the song uh, previously, as I pointed out, the song that we're going to sing in the courts of glory is that deliverance belongs to our God, not to us. That's the song you're going to sing. It, it, it was not by our strengths or our efforts, or our wisdom, but God who brought about our deliverance, our salvation, our deliverance. That's separate from, that's different than redemption. We walk by faith, not by sight. Our focus is on things eternal, not on things that are temporal. And now we go into the fifth chapter where there was no chapter division in the original manuscripts. 
God contrasts that temporary light affliction with an eternal weight of glory. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting opposite. A light affliction and a weight of glory. We, we call the affliction heavy and the anticipation of glory light. I'm certain that we, for the most part, we often spend more time complaining about the light affliction than we do anticipating the glory. The affliction is only momentary. From God's frame of reference, your, your affliction is only an instant in time. And it works for us a far more exceeding eternal way to glory. So we have light versus heavy, and we have momentary versus eternal. And that's beautiful construction. God has placed us in a hostile environment that looks terrifying to us. And He hasn't pulled any punches. He says, or He said that the outward man is going to lose. The outward man is going to perish. If we look at this through the eyes of the inward man, then we'd see that the affliction is light that it's only momentary. But we have a surpassing eternal weight of glory as far as the inward man is concerned. And so the 18th verse concentrates on what we are to consider. While we consider diligently not the things which are seen, The, the word blepo in the Greek there, that we consider diligently not the things which we can see with our eyes, not the things that we can experience in this, in this outward man that's perishing. We're looking with eyes of faith. For we know, verse 1, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For, for in this body we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Now these verses are, are, are used over and over and over again, not only by Christians, but in the, in the literature to speak of our human body versus our, our heavenly hope. But I'm gonna take the road less, a little less traveled here, and I'm gonna suggest that I don't think that's the thought that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here. I believe without any question that the Lord Himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and those that are alive will be caught up together with those who are raised to meet the Lord in the air. Absolutely convinced of that. And I, folks, I wouldn't tear those verses out of my Bible for anything in the world. But unless that happens, your outward man is going to perish. There isn't any question but that it will perish. But I also believe that this is referring to the old man, the nature, the sin nature, the flesh. I'm sorely tempted to make... 5, 1, and 2 be something that it isn't. You know, it's so common in Christian literature and in sermons preached today to use, you know, chapter 5 in speaking of our human body versus our glorified body. I mean, that almost goes without argument. 
we have a human body that's going to be destroyed. We have a glorified body, which we'll get when we're raised from the dead. But I don't think that that is the, the primary thought, the primary discussion taking place here in this particular context. Just given the context, what we read before and what we read after. Now, that poses some kinds of arguments I know, and, and, and if, I, if I turn out to be wrong, well, it'll only be one of, you know, 10,000 things that I've been wrong on when I get to glory. And in stitching the scriptures together, it seems apparent to me that this defiled body will not enter glory and God's going to give me a new undefiled body like Christ, which did not see corruption because he was without sin. Without question, I believe that's true. However, I have problems doing that with these two verses. With these two verses. I believe that they are... Uh, they're a continuation of verse 16. I think that the old man is being contrasted with the new man as well. It's not just looking forward you know, to what's going to occur in the future, but what is occurring right now. The grammar states that we perfectly know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, and that's a subjunctive mood of uncertainty, maybe it will, maybe it won't be. That's what the grammar says. Our tent house on earth. That's, that's something that we made. That's not my human body. That's, that's the cabin that I built in my wilderness. That's the life that I, I worked on. I, I think Christians can carve out all kinds of lives. They can, they can be like the prodigal son and go into the far country. And, and waste their inheritance. They can, they can choose to live a debauched lifestyle. They can choose to sell their souls for pleasure if they care to. Surely, folks, God has given us a, a, a great latitude in, 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 in which to move. How we live out the deliverance that is absolutely ours by the grace of God. Surely he gave that much leeway to the children of Israel. Caleb and Joshua triumphed with the Lord and entered the promised land. The others chose to go other ways. But they did not go to hell. They were God's redeemed people. God redeemed them. Over and over again, God calls them his redeemed. Redemption was never their problem. Obedience was. The inference seems to clearly be that this tent house here is one that is made with hands. Okay, it's surely not my human body. Although I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure someone may email me and say, well, Steve, my, uh, now wait a minute. Um, my tent house was made with hands, my, my, my mother and my father's hands, you know, when, uh, at least when they got together, you know, they formed my body. Boy, I, folks, I, I think that's really reaching. However, it seems to me that my outward man, this, this temple of clay in which I live, is the consideration of verse 16, and the life that I've carved out for that temple of clay is the, is the consideration of verse 1, chapter 5. And the glorified body is, is not the house I have that's, that's eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. That's, that's not primarily my glorified body, but rather that's my position in heaven, in Christ. That's the eternal home 
of the sinless new creation in Christ. I did a video on John 14. I, I kind of slaughtered a sacred cow there. You know, let you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, uh, dwelling places. The words minnow, uh, abide. I go to, pre to prepare a place for you. I'm 100% convinced that the Lord Jesus Christ is saying that, that through His death on the cross, I go and prepare a place that is a position for you a place for you that is in Christ, not heaven. Heaven's nowhere mentioned in that, in that passage. No, heaven's nowhere even mentioned in the context. And this by, by God who's provided more for us than we could ever ask or think. If somehow we could get into our minds how temporary this tent house is and how permanent the other is, we might more enter into the thought of the, of, of the man who, 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 who scribbled this on his jail cell. This, he was, it's anonymous. No, I don't think anybody knows who actually wrote this. The angels from their thrones on high look down on us with wondering eye that where we are but passing guests, we build such strong and solid nests. And where we hope to dwell for I, we scarce take heed a stone to lay. But it just seems like that's kind of how it is. We give a lot of, th of thought to the temporal, not much to the eternal. You know, it would seem to me that a vast amount of my energy, of my effort, is spent building a tent house here, which God calls temporary. And I know that it's going to be dissolved, done away with. But I also know that I have a house, a dwelling place, that is not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, my new nature, that sinless new nature that we read about in 1 John, where His seed abides in me and I cannot sin. So to me, it appears that verses 1 and 2 here in the light of verse 16 suggests that God is not only speaking about our physical body, but our environment in verse 2. For in this we, we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That doesn't look like it's speaking about a glorified body. Now maybe it is. But I'm also thinking about now, here and now. It doesn't seem to be speaking about a glorified body, but rather the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21 of chapter 5, we're not there yet says says for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him now for those of you who like grammar the words he has made is a complete transaction it's never used of something that's incomplete this speaks of the completeness and the finality of the act of God which made the Lord Jesus Christ sin for us that we might be made, that we might become the righteousness of God. I read in the Scriptures that I am to be clothed with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that seems to be a, a distinct consideration from a glorified body in heaven. It looks like then in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, 
that rather than the outward vessel of clay, which is going to perish, my hope is not only for a glorified body, but to be clothed here and now at the present time with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we hear Paul cry out in Philippians that he desired to be clothed not with his own righteousness, okay, but the righteousness which is of faith, the righteousness of God by the faithfulness of Christ. That was the cry of the heart of Paul. To be presently clothed with the righteousness of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3. I'll go, I'll go ahead and read that, Philippians 3, uh, verses 7 through 11. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. That's a genitive there. The faithfulness of Jesus Christ. The righteousness which is of God, it's based on faith that we Paul wrote about in Romans. That I may know him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. If by any means I might attain unto the out-resurrection of the dead, that's a only word only used once in Scripture. It's referring to the present, not the future. It seems the wonder of this passage is not only that I will someday leave this vessel of clay with all of its limitations, with all of its pain, with all of its suffering, that I will someday leave the environment in which it lives, where I will someday receive a glorified body, a body like His, in heaven, but that I be found to operate in a new environment today where I come to realize that what is true of me, I've come to realize that in my, in my experience. That I've been, even now, I've been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. You know, I've, also, I've often thought about if I could just have any request that I wanted uh, in glory, it would be to not sin against my Savior anymore. But Scripture tells me that as a new creation in Christ Jesus, I have a new sinless nature, a new man even now that cannot sin because His seed abides in me and it cannot sin. The new nature can't sin. It was born of God. God doesn't give birth to sinful creatures. It seemed to me, seems to me that that's the hope of this passage. I not only lose the body in which I live, but the environment in which it acts and my hope is one of a new and glorified body in a new and righteous environment. And yet, regardless of that future fulfillment, apart from changing locations, the new life that I possess now is a little different than the life I'll someday have. I've often tried to tell people, you know, you have eternal life. Live as though you have eternal life. Now. It's not something you're going to have someday. You now have it. The passage that we are looking at is God des describing, among other things, the Christian life. Your life, my life. That's, that's what I, I read. Read it. Okay? The question that I've had to ask when it comes to such descriptions is this, is 
Is God describing what the ideal Christian life is if we should just ever decide that that's what we want, you know, or don't want? Or is God simply describing how the Christian life is by grace? That's what I want you to think about. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for listening. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.